to the second debate on this round on identity politics. Uh, my name is Jack Harris, I'm a policy researcher and a recent graduate uh, in history. Uh, and I'll be chairing this debate which is titled Snowflakes or Revolutionaries, What is the New Student Identity? Which is partnered by Academics for Freedom and Living Freedom. Why do I think this debate is important? Well, I think the future of British democracy will be influenced in a, in a large way by uh, the growing student population in this country. I think in 1984, I think about 14% of people used to go to university, whereas now that number's about 42%. And so students aren't going anywhere. In actual fact, I think Tony Blair's dream of a sort of graduate dominated society is finally getting there. So I think in the future, we will be sort of composed in the majority by students. And if we are living in a democracy, that sovereign will be mostly graduate dominated. So I think students are really important people to talk about at the moment. And uh, I think we're going to have a really good debate because of that. Uh, with this considered, I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers who are all in one capacity or another part of the academic bubble. First to be speaking will be James Burns. Uh, James is a third year undergraduate studying history at the University of Oxford. He has written about politics and education on his blog for Ario magazine, focusing on curricular reform and student activism. Uh, after that will be Jim Butcher. Jim Butcher is a university lecturer and writer. He has written on a diverse range of subjects including citizenship, free speech and education. His latest book is Volunteer Tourism, The Lifestyle Polit Politics of International Development. Uh, after that will be Atiyab Rashid. Uh, Atiyab is an undergraduate in philosophy at King's College London. He's a committed member of the Liberal Democrats and incoming vice president of the King's College London Liberal Democratic Society. And finally will be Tanya Kekic, who uh, finally actually produced this debate with me as well at Living Freedom. Uh, Tanya studies history and politics at the University of Warwick and is currently on a year abroad. She is, she is an inspiring writer and has written for Warwick Congress, a student-run society on the importance of free speech. She's also a alumnus of uh, Living Freedom. Before James kicks us off with the debate, I uh, just want to quickly run through the format. So it'll be sort of three to five minutes opening remarks from all the speakers. After that, we're just going to go straight to the audience for a sort of question and answer, sort of public conversation, sort of question style uh, format. So, um, yeah, so make sure while the speakers are talking, prepare some notes. Challenge them what they haven't, haven't said, and sort of really get involved in this debate as well. That's, that's what the Battle of Ideas is all about. So anyway, first speak is James Burns. Snowflakes are revolutionaries. To say the obvious, it is a bit of a false dichotomy. Many actual revolutionaries are not exactly known for their tolerance towards those who oppose the views. But in any case, I'm inclined to say that most students are neither. Before I go into the issue of no platforming, I think it would be worth just establishing that students are more ideologically diverse, or rather ideologically neutral, than it sometimes appears. Most 18 to 24 year olds do not plan to vote Labour, and only 20% would describe themselves as socialists. Most would not call themselves capitalist either, in fact, most say that, that, are, that they are neither or that they don't know. In this, we are pretty similar to the rest of the general public. Of course, students do tend to be more radical on social issues than everyone else, but so is each generation compared to the one that came before them. And like every other age group, there's a bunch of us who are much more politically engaged, and this, and this is this minority that is usually responsible for controversies they get flagged in the press. As they are very passionate about what they believe, they stand and usually get positions of power within student bodies and student media. They are then treated as if they have mandates that it is impossible for them to have. You may have heard last week that Oxford Student Union, as opposed to the Oxford Union Debating Club, voted in favour of applauding through jazz hands rather than clapping. This is intended to look after those with sensory issues and hearing aids. It may also interest you to know that the turnout at the last election for that body was around 20%. The National Union of Students has a turnaround of around 30%. There's a huge democratic deficit in student politics. Most of us are disengaged or simply don't care. And that's very easy to say that such apathy is complacent, but in an age where most members of the public easily get bored with politics, it's not unique to students. So we should be cautious about treating the state and actors with containers as representative of students as a whole, not least because it reinforces the self importance of those campaigners. The controversies highlighted in the media are as much clashes between students themselves as they are between students and faculty, or students and certain public figures. Let's not forget that the various people who have been known platform were often invited by students to begin with. And of course, we hear about those who have been known platform, but we don't hear about those who are not. Nigel Farage, Jacob rees mogg and Peter Hitchens are among those who have used outside the mainstream of student opinion that have spoken at university events within, within the past year. Indeed, a YouGov survey last year found that students were hardly more inclined to want to stop offensive views being platformed at universities than the rest of the public. Now, none of this is to deny that there have been incidents that range from ridiculously concerning, and I'm sure they'll be mentioned sooner or later. 
My starting point, and I've been this bold particularly profound one, is that this debate is more complex and multifaceted than is sometimes made out. Thank you. Uh, so brilliant start from James there. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, which is Jim, Jim Butcher. Thank you, Jack. Um, I came to Battle of Ideas last year, and I was the only man uh, on the Me Too panel. And I'm the only oldie on the youth panel today. <laughs> <laughs> Go easy on the face. Um, I think the, the effort at Snowflakes is probably quite appropriate uh, in relation to the antics of some students' unions and some uh, identity-oriented societies at, 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 at uh, universities as well. When anti-abortion stalls are banned at freshers' fairs, I think it's appropriate to say that snowflake behaviour. These are ideas, fairly widely held ideas that people have, and on the University of all places they should be, to be able to be, be heard. I wrote a little bit about a case of the elected MEP Bill Etheridge, UKIP MEP, who was uh, <coughs> platformed from Sussex University jointly under a zero tolerance policy and a safe space policy, they had him with two policies basically there. And I think that's outrageous. And I think, you know, if people want to have a go at that and use the term snowflakes, that's fine. In fact, he wasn't, people said he wasn't on the platform, they said to him, you have to give your speech in for betting so that we can check that the words within that speech will not cause harm to any of our students. I find that, well, I can't speak for others, of course, but I know some students campaigning around it did find that, as much as anything else, incredibly patronising. However, it's not a very useful term generally, and there's a number of <coughs> reasons for that. The first is that it tends to get applied generally as a label uh, that, that sort of sums up all students. And yet, in fact, the policies and so on around this and the protests tend to be very small cliques of students working very, very closely with, uh, through student unions, actually with universities themselves. At times, it seems to me over the past 10 years, universities and student unions have been falling over themselves to outdo each other in terms of these kind of policies. And so you have the duplication of these policies very often at the level of the university uh, and the level of the students as well. Uh, I suppose from their point of view, they might say, better safe than sorry. From my point of view, it ratchets, ratchets up a culture uh, within which people are readily interpreted as vulnerable to ideas at a university, which is quite a remarkable uh, thing. The other reason I don't think snowflake students is a great term to use is it because it tends to, in the way it's used, deflect attention from a more important point. And that is the way that universities themselves socialise students into this kind of culture uh, of offence taking. Um, I organised a debate at my university uh, end of last year on what is a university for invited a number of speakers, we invited the NUS speaker, particularly they didn't turn up, but um, they cried off. But we had speakers from um, the lect our lecturers, our lecturers union, which I'm on the committee of, uh, our students and so on. It's very, very interesting, two out of the four mem members on, on the panel, when they were asked what the university was actually for, they basically said, it's about surviving, it's about dealing with mental health problems. Ideas and knowledge didn't come into it. This was the union member and the student representative. Now, I'm not saying that they're in any way representative of all students, but this is the kind of narrative that's out there that people are encouraged to buy into readily. You know, that, 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 that's the thing that, that's kind of out there, really. Another good example of this was when the SOAS lecturer, Gunnar Beck, uh, was revealed as standing for the right-wing German political party, the AFD, earlier this year. And students and staff organized protests against him. It was mainly the staff, and in fact, one of the main officials from my own union, UCU, turned up. Not to say we disagree with these ideas, we want to debate and we want to defeat these ideas, but to say this person's presence on campus is a threat to staff and student safety. So it's a completely different configuration of the way we see um, you know, uh, 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 ideas uh, in, 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 in that respect. Um, and it was quite appalling, from my point of view, to hear lecturers, trade union officials, calling for the sacking another lecturer on the basis of their ideas. I can't think of any, not too many precedents for that. And in fact, universities do have a Byzantine world of policies, code of conduct, dignity of work policies, that you, if you're a student, sign up to. When you pay your £9,000, a section of that goes towards student unions. You don't get a choice in that, you're not asked about that. You sign up for that. I don't think people tell you about that. Fortunately, most students are pretty oblivious to it. They get on with learning, enjoying themselves, fulfilling themselves, 
But if you come up against these things, believe me, it's a fairly authoritarian uh, kind of process. And as a trade union rep, I've represented people, and I've also seen students uh, in this situation. Universities have their own codes, their own laws. They've got about convicting people when the police would convict you, uh, and so on. And I find it quite outrageous. And it does sort of feed into an idea of the university campus, especially campus universities, I think, as a place that's almost separate from society, where you can expect different rules, different standards, and those standards are kind of there for you to protect you from these ideas. It's ironic that a meeting that I could go on and organise uh, with no problem in the town centre in Canterbury where I live, I could not organise without going through a whole lot of bureaucratic processes, being told certain things I have to do, and maybe even being told I can't have a speed just one minute left. Yeah. Okay. So, very briefly then, revolutionaries. I don't think there's a kind of contradiction between the idea of snowflakes and revolutionaries, because it seems to me that some, not all by any means, and I don't want to fall into the trap of caricature in the sort of situation, but some student protests are precisely on the basis of, you know, we get together and we protest because we need to be protected. So there isn't that kind of contradiction there on the one hand between the snowflake students, caricature, and revolutionary uh, on the other. They do really coalesce around these kind of ideas and these things of safety and psychological safety. At the end of the day, many student protests, such as they are, are precisely around safe space, about protecting students uh, from ideas that, 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 they, that they don't uh, that. like. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jeff. Brilliant from Jim, really. I think what he's touching on is the sort of the threats coming from above and below, not just from the student groups from below that are no platform, but actually from above as well, the sort of bureaucrats at universities who are sort of imposing these codes on us. So it's really a lot to build on there. Um, anyway, next speaking is Atel. Your open remarks, please. Um, yeah, well, one thing I want to note is that I usually don't like talking about politics, and I'm a student of philosophy, so I'm going to approach it from sort of a more philosophical perspective. What is a snowflake? Um, it's really, really hard to define. And the two things I usually use to define it are two different ideas. This new revision of the moral status of the victim and an expansionist view of notions of psychological harm. And without these two things, you can't really realize what's going on here. I think lots of people like to assume that this is just students, you know, quite radical leftists trying to implement their own ideologies onto people, which is partly true, but I think that tries to see it through the lens of old-style politics, where this really does represent something new. Now, um, the sociologists uh, Brian Campbell, Jason Manning, um, put out a great paper in 2014 talking about microaggressions and moral cultures. And in this, they talked about the defining social virtues that we have in our society. And, he, and they make this distinction between historically dignity cultures and honour cultures. Honour cultures, I'm sure we're all aware of them. Some of them still exist in, around the world and actually in some sort of less economically advantaged areas of the Western world. And the idea is obviously that your social value is defined by your status, as in if someone insults you, you have taken a notch your social value, you have to defend your honour. And they contrast this with a dignity culture, where your dignity is an internal quality. It's not available to the public. If someone insults you, you don't have to respond to that. You can take recourse to sort of um, figures of justice, sure. But if I get insulted by someone, that doesn't necessarily mean anything bad for me. And now they give us this third characterization, victimhood culture, which says that my social value is determined by the way other people see me. But it's not that if someone insults me, I am weak and I have to make up for that. It's so somewhat the opposite. If someone insults me, I am a victim, and that gives me some sort of value, some sort of power. And one of the things I like talking about in philosophy is one of the pivotal figures of 20th century philosophy, Michel Foucault. He's often maligned as this sort of radical leftist thinker, and he did have his leftist tendencies. But I think the most important thing about Foucault was his analysis of power in that he said that almost all social interactions are essentially a power play. And he talks about this in terms of the way a hospital is built, is sort of um, there to assert power over patients. And so I really do somewhat subscribe to this view, and I think 
we might say people are being snowflakes because they want to be protected from harm. I don't necessarily agree. I think a lot of the time it is something of a power play. And where snowflakeism comes in is within this victimhood culture with this idea, as I say, with an expansionist view of psychological harm. There was a great paper on this by Nick Hazel of philosopher at the University of Melbourne, where he talked about how over the past 30 to 50 years, notions of harm within psychology have become massively, massively expanded. And he talks about things like trauma, because trauma originally, if you looked at it in a medical sense, means essentially brain damage. But now it means anything, essentially, that can invoke uh, significant stress. Bullying has gone from you know, verbal, physical attack to um, victimization through exclusion. And the thing that concerns us the most, I think, is prejudice from sort of the old-fashioned prejudice. You know, for 100 years back, it would have been the terrible crime of lynching. 50 years back, it would have been racial abuse in the streets. Now it's expanded to things like microaggressions, unconscious bias, dog whistle theory. And this represents this sort of quantifiably expansionist view of what it means to do harm to someone. And I don't think this is just people becoming more sensitive. I really do take the view that if we see this through the lens of power, if being a victim, like um, Campbell and Manning in this victim group culture say, gives you moral status, gives you authority, then it's desirable to have this expansionist view of moral harm. And I think that is really what is at the core of this whole snowflake movement. And, yeah. Thanks for that, Ash. That was a really interesting perspective from the philosophical side of things. Uh, things I haven't heard before or seen in the media. So, excellent. Um, finally, Tanya. Thank you. So, I was recently having a drink with some British students I'd met in Utrecht where I'm studying for a year. And one girl had just got back from a climate march in the day and was saying she wants to do more to help save the planet. She began to explain how angry she was about the state of recycling in Utrecht. The Dutch are meant to be leaders in sustainability and the environment, and yet there tends to be only one bin for all rubbish in flat buildings. So she was getting all wiped up, and she said she's been thinking she needs to do something big, something radical. She tells us she's going to send an email to her landlord asking for a better bin system. <laughs> I think this nicely sums up the plight of radicalism among students today. Today, student activists are not revolutionary. On most major political issues of our time, they tend to be aligned with the establishment. The Brexit debate has shown just how unradical most students are. <coughs> the EU referendum presented an opportunity for a radical political shape-up, a chance for students to vote against unrepresentative and distant elites in Brussels and Westminster. Instead, the majority of students took the side of the elites, the majority of MPs, the supranationals, the IMF, the World Bank, the major corporations, and so on. They voted for the status quo and against change. Not only did the majority of students back remain in the 2016 referendum, many have spent the past three years campaigning to overthrow the largest democratic mandate in British history. Radicals once trusted ordinary people over the state, but today so-called student radicals campaign in opposition to the working class, whether that be in calling for a second referendum on Brexit or taking to the streets to protest about climate change and consumer society. Students protesting about climate change think that they are radical, but support for environmentalism is far from revolutionary. It goes against the aspiration for more wealth and material comfort. Climate change activists do not call for progress, but seek to limit human consumption and growth. Support for Jeremy Corbyn is often seen as a badge of student radicalism. Many young people are looking for some kind of alternative politics, but Corbynism, and even less so the Labour Party, is not the answer. Its programme is essentially about redistribution, working within the capitalist framework and tinkering <coughs> at the edges, rather than imagining a radically different way of organising society. I think the unrevolutionary nature of contemporary student politics is made clear when comparing it to student activism of the 60s and the 70s. Whether it was protests against the Vietnam War, the apartheid regime in South Africa, or British rule in Northern Ireland, student activism was once motivated by anger about injustices at home and in the rest of the world, and focused on issues beyond students' immediate horizons. 
Student activism today is very different. Students are not marching en masse against the persecution of the Kurds in Syria. They are not taken to the streets in solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters. Nor did they march in support of the Iranian women who last year <coughs> protested mandatory headscarves. Instead, students today march about relatively trivial issues, such as the gross jokes made in a private group chat at Warwick University. In contrast to the student activists of the 60s, who fought against university administrators and the in loco parentis policy that restricted their freedom, today's students demand protection from authority. At my university, the demand for puppy therapy sessions every exam period to help students deal with exam stress is a good example of the kind of infantilizing policies that get little kickback among students. So students are not revolutionary, but this is not to say that all students are snowflakes. There is a trend of intolerance and censorship on campuses, but many students have little time for the bizarre student antics that often reaches the news headlines. Many students I have met at university are keen to debate complex and controversial issues and don't claim they are offended every time someone disagrees with them. The loud minority of student union activists do not speak for all students, but they are the ones making the impression and students need to do more to kick back. Uh, thank you for that, Tanya. Uh, we're going to head over now to the audience for some questions. Uh, Tanya yeah, said that um, you broadly accepted Foucault's uh, idea that language is a form of power, but I think that's a very dangerous thing to accept, because once you do that, then the distinction between words and physical action uh, disappears, and that opens up the argument that words can in themselves be a form of coercion. And once you accept that, then the whole logic of pluralist democracy goes, goes out of the window because anybody can then argue that somebody else's right to speak is in fact a form of oppression, and that has to be curtailed. And it seems to me that this kind of postmodernist philosophy is really at the heart of the illiberal um, problems we face, not just within universities, but throughout our society. Uh, Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party, Justice for Men and Boys. Along with our 31-year-old Director of Communications, uh, Elizabeth Hobson, um, I was due to give a talk at Cambridge University about six months ago. Part of the opposition to that came from feminists writing an open letter to the Vice-Chancellor demanding that, that we not be allowed to speak. Uh, it was full of lies, misrepresentations, um, and 507 students, academics, and alumni signed the associated petition. Um, it seemed that not, not one person at the university contacted us to ask, was there any truth in, in the claims in the open letter? Of course, there, were, there, of course there wasn't any truth. Um, and it, it seems to us that high intelligence is associated very closely with high gullibility. And I wonder if the panel can talk about uh, you know, how it is that at a university with 23,000 students, not one of them had the intellectual curiosity to, to, to think, Hmm, maybe, maybe there are some truths in this letter. My question is going to start with the sort of context of who I am as a, as a former student. So I was at Kent University, so in the, that general area. And I did a computer science up to PhD level. So I've been at the university for a long time, but not in any way connected to anything political. And in all my time, so probably about seven years at university, Never got involved in student politics, never voted on any sort of union elections or anything like that. So there's something completely detached from my reality at university. So now that we're older, uh, I can see how there's things, discussions going on that might potentially change the world in a way that we may agree or not agree with, which at the time um, I was kind of not involved in that conversation, didn't think it was relevant. So I guess my question is how to engage. People like myself in that time who are completely focused on uh, their studies and a particular area of study which might not be political at all and try and um, make the case for why they should be aware of things and if there is something they don't like that they are should be part of that conversation and get uh, to inspire them to get involved. I'm actually director of an organisation called Liberate and Debate, where we do promote freedom of speech and discussion at universities. So say for instance um, I actually hosted Bill Etheridge uh, two years ago, and I actually worked through that. I had to go with the Students' Union, we had to go through the legislation, um, some of us got spat on by protesters. 
Um, also, we are the only organisation at universities that has rewritten a safe space policy. So I think, you know, at least in terms of some form of contribution, we have some sort of pertinent opinion. I certainly take issue in using terminology such as snowflakes and revolutions. I think it's immediately antagonistic if you're attempting to diagnose this debate. Because it almost strikes me as a sort of boomer fear, actually, about what students are. You know, what are their intentions? I think we've had revolutions read at universities since, well, ever since universities have been a thing. We can talk about the 80s and sort of coal mines and the strikes there. But say for instance, what Liberate the Debate does, and our perspective is, is that a lot of students, there isn't a space at university outright where students can actually truly debate and engage emotionally about their opinions, have them exercise and truly express. And so I put to you in the sense that I think that the issue is a lot more sort of systemic and in a large sense, I'm not necessarily sure whether they're just immediately talking about sort of snowflakes or revolutionaries or the NUS in a wider part is actually a useful frame of discussion. You know, because I've worked with student unions, I've been spat on by protesters, I have friends who term themselves revolutionaries, and what you may term uh, certainly snowflakes. And so I want to ask whether is this a useful frame of debate in the first place? Thank you. I think that what we're talking about in terms of the binary, I think personally, uh, snowflakes and revolutionaries, uh, the, the significant minority of students who may label themselves revolutionaries, those same students may be labelled by others as snowflakes. And I think that's because the methods of change and the, the, the way they see themselves as powerful has shifted. So in the past you would demand of your government or demand of someone that they change something. You have to change this. I'm not happy with it or I'm going to protest and strike, etc. Whereas now, you demand to be noticed for your victim page. You demand that you see how you're suffering. Or you make yourself a martyr. You know, if you take climate change, for example, um, there are problems in the world. There are problems with extreme weather, pollution. There are problems. I, don't, I think that's true. However, how do we deal with it as, a, as humanity? We don't... Um, we, we think about technology, new solutions, innovation. We don't um, paint ourselves white and wear weird red... Costumes and dance around on a bridge with people are trying to get work. You know, so it's just the, the frame, the lens, the frame through which we see ourselves as agents of change. How do we see ourselves as agents of change? It's shifted in a really, really wrong direction. Yeah, I think the problem with kind of giving privilege and power to victim groups is that you create other victim groups. So, for example, the um, preposterous idea of banning clapping because it might trigger people with auditory issues, what about the blind people? you just created another group who can't appreciate the appreciation. <laughs> I think uh, Tanya makes a brilliant point, is absolutely spot on in um, asking us to contrast the student protests of the 1960s and 1970s uh, with the Warwick protest, the example <coughs> we used, where students were essentially protesting against another group of students on the same campus. And uh, I've just come from the session where we were discussing solidarity and whether solidarity exists today. And I think it's certainly the case that there's no solidarity among students nowadays. And uh, I think it seems to be the case that if students have a problem with another student on campus, rather than being expected to sort that out among themselves, the inclination is always to defer to a kind of adult authority, if you like, to lecturers or to disciplinary officers or um, uh, bureaucrats essentially who work within the university uh, and the problem is of course that this is exactly what students are encouraged to do um, they're almost told that if they have problems with each other then they should defer to this authority but um, my concern really is just how how debilitating this becomes if you never get to discuss with other people if you never get opportunities to forge that solidarity uh, if you are always seeing protest against each other rather than seeking uh, what you might have in common with each other uh, and seeking external sources of authority to sort out your problems for you, it's actually um, not at all helpful for facing life beyond the university campus. To make the point and also ask the question of whether we kind of talk about radicalism as it connects to activism and what I believe to be a kind of expired definition of what activism means. We have a different kind of, we have a different structure of society that doesn't allow activism to happen in the same way that it might have happened when we talk about sort of like stereotyped marches or political movements or social movements like the civil rights movement, for example. We have this idea that 
we exist in a society that sort of like permits that kind of successful revolution, but I don't think we do because the way we have activism has changed because there's not really a build-up of a movement. A movement can happen very quickly because the way you recruit people into an idea is through social media or through a digital age. And so the fact that you get that immediacy, um, although is good in some sense for spreading a certain message, um, is damaging to this fact that the movement is actually quite fragile. So do you think that making the connection between activism and radicalism is kind of not wrong, but I would say that it's activism that is becoming more of like a weekend thing or like a pastime thing rather than a radical thing. So maybe it's the fall of activism itself rather than students are not actually that revolutionary anymore. Hello, I just want to um, say that the table has brought up some really good points, including the fact that seeing students as a one lip of being snowflakes is not accurate. But I think at the same time, there's also like a scene, seeing like students who are politically active as a one lip as well. I think the minority of students who are um, quote unquote revolutionaries or students who are snowflakes, I think they're both equal in the, in the way that they are both extremely small minorities. Um, there are a lot of people who are not really trying to demand ridiculous things but can't help but be politically active because of who they are and things are inherent to who they are as a person. You have women who are feminists because they are women and they want to be treated equally. You have people who, who support pride because they're like LGBT and they want to be treated equally. Um, yeah, so I think there's just a lot. Um, a lot of ideas that if someone is, you have people like Greta Thunberg who's like a young person and people are trying to tout her as a revolutionary, even herself, she has like refused awards because that's not what she wants to be seen as, she's just a person who's trying to, like a young person who's been seen as a snowflake who's trying to make change in a world that she doesn't believe um, is, you know, improving or is progressive and creating an environment which is good for young people. Um, so yeah, I just want to ask a question, at what point does the term snowflake just become a way for the old guard to oppress the political ideas of young people rather than a uh, word that's used to describe like, people who take um, progressiveness to an extreme? Yeah. And those are really interesting points to get back at this, especially Greta Thunberg, even though we want to keep it strictly to university students, that's a different kind of fish, I think. Um, as we're going to talk again in the old days, so to add to have any thoughts? Yeah, obviously, quite a range of questions there. So I'll try to say that my friend over there, who raised the book, uh, Foucault, who characterized my characterization of Foucault as um, words and language uh, being power plays. Not exactly. I characterize it more as social interactions broadly, as in within the sphere of public interaction, political interaction, people signal in order to um, attract power. I don't think that's a very controversial thesis. You know, you read the writings of you know the Federalist Papers, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, talking about you know the crass opinions of the masses and the need for a government in order to calm the passions of the day. I believe James Madison said it. The fact that people in um, society will have differing views on things, and we know that, and will also want you know their policies to be implemented, will almost always lead to the fact that a lot of social interaction will be through this lens of wanting to accumulate power, or accumulate political um, capital. And I think you characterize it as, you know, my characterization, representing a threat to liberal democracy, where I absolutely disagree. I think it's a defense of liberal democracy in the idea that because we have so many countervailing opinions, we need a framework, we need civil institutions which can you know, um, bring some semblance of order to them and make Board thinking political decisions out of those. And so I, I'm not sure I agree with sort of your view of what I said. Um, so, so, Asya, just to be absolutely clear, are we saying then that students are fragile and they're delicate and they need to be protected, or do you think they're using it, as you're suggesting, as a form of capital in order to get on in the world? In other words, to be a victim is actually um, quite a trendy thing to do in a way to progress. Um, just well, to say, 30 seconds. I'm going to say, that, you know, we do, like, I don't want to trivialise because we do have a legitimate mental health crisis among students and there are many problems that face society. Obviously, you can tell I have an awful wispy moustache right now because of November. Mental health is a very, very big issue. But I do think when 
this becomes politicized, then we have an issue. Then it is about power. And, and James? Yes, so there was a good point there raised about the different strands of student activism. A, a lot of it is about rather trivial causes, but then there is some, students also complain on issues like the living wage and homelessness. And there's, and I, I suppose that's not really revolutionary, it's a very easy thing to be for in terms of the living wage ever gets in terms of homelessness. But students, there are genuine a real issues which students concern themselves with. Some raised what about how um, how most people are able to get away with it, why does no one raise a countervailing uh, view? Um, I think it's partly to do with the marketization of higher education, I guess a bit of a buzzword, but um, because universities are in an increasingly competitive university market, universities don't really want to do anything which could attract negative publicity. So if they're um, so if there's a, if there's a complaint that they're hosting a racist speaker or a, or they've got a sexist lecture or, or whatever, they they pretty they want to respond to that pretty quickly because they don't want to give out a, a negative impression. They need to attract as many students as possible because because of tuition fees, um, they need to their funds and their and resources they have is tied to the amount of students they get. I think that's partly why it's able to thrive. Um, uh, just to put you on the spot as well, James. Um, sure. So it sounds like what you were saying as well when you were opening remarks was that there's a sort of a, a loud minority and there's a lot of people just standing there and watching, which seems to be the reason why we're talking about uh, this student problem. How, how, do, how do you resolve that? Do we be passive? Uh, is there a solution or do we just have to accept it for what it is? Right, so I don't think like sneering stereotypes like the snowflake really helps with that. But it's partly because universities themselves have universities themselves have a rather false idea of what students are like because they base their impressions um, on the campaign of the loud minority do. If they were sort of sit back and listen and not respond to the uh, to to just um, react based on one or two tweets, they might have a better idea of what students do. For their for their part, I think uh, students need to uh, raise their objections, not try and turn it into a culture war, but just Stake out a more moderate position. Um. And uh, Jim, any to come back on from the audience? Yeah, of course, lots of fantastic points. Uh, one point that struck me was the gentleman who talked about the idea of how, perhaps compared to the past, we see ourselves as agents of change in a very different way, perhaps not at all, but certainly in a very different way today uh, than in the past. One thing that's really been striking to me is a lot of academics uh, looking at this say not a lot's changed. They don't have this. Sort of sense of, you know, wouldn't be having this debate, for example, at all. Um, so they point to the fact that no platforming has been around in the past, pioneered, I think, you know, in the 1970s, and then in the 1980s, and so on. And in fact, what, one, one kind of ironic thing is, it's very often uh, those people who are saying nothing's really changed, it's a panic. They're the people who talk about snowflakes in a kind of ironic way. They sort of look at people like me and say, Jim, why are you always branding people snowflakes? I'm not. Uh, when people are just the same as the past, young people are very capable, very radical. Uh, and all the rest of it. I mean, just one way into that I found kind of useful in, in trying to understand what has changed in the way people see the world and the, what, the way they want to act upon the world is to think back to when I was civil rights and some of these guys on the panel here, uh, and there were quite tumultuous times in, in British politics. There was a mine strike when I went to university. Uh, I never really attended my university in the first year because of the mine strike. And uh, the young <coughs> radical, I was in the Labour Party, that might sound like a contradiction in terms now, but back then, that we, uh, we went and we support the miners. And the Conservative government set, uh, sent uh, an MP, you may have heard of, called Harvey Proctor, to speak at our university. And there were protests, and he was chased away, and he didn't get to speak. And I remember sitting and reflecting on that with other people. Some people said it was a great victory. Others said, well, what was the point of that? Uh, all that's happened is we've been branded red fascists and um, you know we haven't won any arguments and, and, and so on. And I think it probably was some of what we did was wrong back then. But one interesting thing, nobody talked about well-being. Nobody talked about Harvey Proctor, this right-wing MP, being a threat to uh, sort of people's well-being, mental health, psychology. They said the government was a threat to the working class and the miners and that was the basis of their protest. I think what's, what's changed since then, what you can see happening kind of incrementally, really kind of built up over the last 10 years, is an extension of the idea that there's a harm principle. The idea that, uh, that um, you know, people should be able to do what they want, John Stuart Mill's idea, as long as it doesn't materially affect 
directly somebody else physically or in some other very direct material kind of way. It seems to be since the 80s when I was the HQ guys and today, the harm principle has been expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded to cover um, slights, psychological slights and feelings. And one very, very interesting thing is if you look at all policies in related to universities um, uh, around whether it's harassment or bullying or codes of conduct or any of these in safe spaces, they all take as their point of reference. How did this action make you feel? Not what did it mean? What was the intent of it? What was the context of it? But how did this action make you feel? Yeah. And if you follow that through, of course, we're in very, very dangerous territory. Because feelings are very subjective. And pretty much anything that therefore causes offence can be brought into this kind of censorious debate about what should and shouldn't be allowed. And that never would have happened even back in the 1980s, although you can see signs of it, definitely. Sure. And um, finally, Tanya, we go back to the audience and have a round of questions. Yeah, I think this idea of the expanding definition of what is harmful actually gets to the core of why people are censoring and cutting down speech on campuses. I think it's linked to the idea that students are fundamentally fragile and that certain ideas or concepts may be mentally damaging and cause them harm. So what's different about no platforming of the past and today is that in the 60s or 70s, maybe it was motivated by a wish to shut down extremist political views that um, they disagreed with. But today, it's about the idea that bringing these speakers on will cause people mental harm. On the point here that was made about snowflakes being used to dismiss like a progressive kind of progressiveness to an extreme, I don't think actually what people are protesting about is progressive. As you say, it's actually all about identity and the self, women protesting about feminism because they are a woman or something. It's not about issues that are beyond the self, it's all about um, me and identity politics. I don't think that's a progressive form of politics. <laughs> In the Arab Spring, all of these social movements that were performing for greater democracy and for greater transparency within the governments all originated on Facebook. They're all Facebook social media movements. And the big problem with all those movements was that it got to a point where there were no leaders in all of the movements. They were all just masses of people, all thinking the same thing, but without any direction. And especially in Egypt, it's just reversed to the situation before the Arab Spring. No real progress happened. So I want to uh, also ask the panel um, really about the leaders within these movements, how these movements are led. I also want to uh, ask. Do you believe that safe spaces become an echo chamber for um, people's opinions to, to be reinforced and how safe spaces really damage the debate instead of improving them? And I also want to see what you think about the term false consciousness with all of the um, issues about how they're not really addressing real world problems. I think the shutting down of free speech by students, uh, this is Atiyah, uh, could be uh, a, a symptom of a fear of, of losing the game of mental superiority. That if I shut down that social interaction, I never have to accept the fact that my opinion could be wrong, or I could be a bad debater, or that uh, I could simply not be very good at school. This is my research area, and I'm, I think you outlined my thesis, so thank you. <laughs> um, there are so many voices missing in this argument, certainly the voices of VCs who historically would stood up, stand up for academic freedom, who would have stood up and said, no, we're not going to stop this, students have a right to hear this, they seem to be gone, and I, I, I agree that um, it's probably the consumer protection model of education in the UK, but also marketization of education in North America has contributed to that, so that voice is gone. Do you hear another voice on campus? Is there outrage um, from that, that segment of students who might say um, that my educational, the quality of my education is being diminished, that I can no longer hear things? because it almost never comes up in North America. I can only recall one case where it was a, a liberal college in Oregon, uh, on a Western history course, uh, a group protested that there, there were too many, there were um, no voices of color in European history, um, and it was a black student who stood up and said, sit down, I want to learn. I, I don't care what it is, I want to learn, and you're ruining my education. That's the only incident that I can recall being reported where other students are saying, sit down, we want to listen, even if it's 
you know, an invidious assault. We want to want to hear. Do you hear this on campus? Is it present? And what's happening to that one? Really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm I'm a lecturer um, and an academic, and just following on from this last question, one of the things that we I think always miss in conversations about this topic is where is education in all of this? To be a revolutionary, you need to know in depth what it is that you are revolting against. Whereas, and I think this is why students aren't radical, as you say, because too often now in university, students aren't turning up to lectures. They aren't turning up to lessons. They're not reading the text. In a, lit in a literary degree, they turn up having not read the book studying for the week and this happens every single week and yet the amount of protests that we hear about content and course material is massive <laughs> um, and, and, and I can't put these two things together because if you want to revolt against something you need to know the facts and you need to know what it is that you disagree with and yet as it is at the moment everything feels so superficial it, um, and I think that's probably the thing that I feel we really need to change in this. Not talking about snowflakes, because it doesn't really change anything, but talking about instead, right, what we're going to do with education. How do we change education so that it becomes something that students actually want to get involved with, as opposed to, you know, missing because they're too anxious about the content. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that uh, the word uh, entitlement hasn't come up. Yeah, because it's one that I often hear about in this debate. And I'm going to kind of like take the, uh, the pressure or the, the spotlight off the actual students. And I think this is a kind of entitlement that's being thrust upon them. And I think there's one of them has already been mentioned, this kind of marketization of universities. And I think you're entirely right that, you know, it's a PR stunt almost. But also, I think because the students themselves see it as a kind of commodity. Um, you know, I'm paying nine grand a year for this thing. I'm entitled to be in an environment where I feel safe. And weirdly, it's not I'm entitled to an education. They kind of forget about that. Um, but I also think, you know, there's an entitlement that's been thrust upon them by parents. I'm sure a lot of people here have read Claire Fox's brief book and um, Jonathan Haidt and Greg, I can never say his name, Lukianos, The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, where does parenting come into all of this? Because, uh, you know, the, the society which we've created, you have these left-leaning universities. Uh, but you also have the only people who can afford to send their kids to university are also left leaning. And so I think it, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on, yes, okay, these are the students who are acting in this way, but what's the role of, of the parents there? And, and is it really the fault of the student, or is it the fault of the university, or the parent, or uh, the society that we talked about, the philosophical one, which I don't really agree with, but I'll find you later. <laughs> I think the thing is, the only thing you've got to do really as a young person is to establish independence, genuine independence from your family and from your parents and from your uh, the adults uh, who have gone before you. But what that means, I think, <laughs> echoing the uh, lecturer there, and I sympathise with turning up to a seminar and nobody's done a reading, <laughs> uh, it's just, it's normal, absolutely normal. So, uh, you know, let's have a go at students for that. But I think the, um, the problem is, is this kind of symbiotic relationship, actually parasitical by the university authorities and a lot of staff uh, within the university who want young blood and they kind of want, they need your money and they also need the sense that you are radical, you are activists. And so you now have, I'm in the social sciences, you now have some activist uh, degrees. So degrees in sociology, the purpose of which is to create a generation of activists. Now how can you do that and also develop young people as a critical, genuinely critical individuals who are also independent. And it's just impossible because all you're going to do is cultivate a new layer of people who will police those around them and those that come after. And so I think the task of young people is to really ask very difficult questions about what it means to really truly be independent. We won't have any more time for questions, unfortunately. We've got to wrap up soon. It's got five minutes left. Can we just have a sort of minute close of remarks and um, start back to have again? We'll go in the order that I'm before. Yeah, to me, I'm not sure I agree, actually. Uh, you know, the idea that uh, they're using these ideas of harm in order to avoid debating because they can't back up their positions. I'm not sure I buy that necessarily. I think, you know, being able to avoid debates because by saying this would cause harm, I think it's more of a 
side consequence rather than uh, the main thrust. Another point I want to make, and it's been in a few questions here, is you know this idea of what is the link between snowflakeism and radicalism. And one of the reasons I wanted to make this speech not about the phenomenon itself, but what causes it and what typifies it, is the fact that not every student with a revolutionary idea is a snowflake, and not every snowflake is a revolutionary. You know, if every student with a revolutionary idea was a snowflake, then John Wycliffe was the greatest snowflake of all time. And so I think we have to be careful in addressing that. With the sort of question about uh, uh, Jonathan Hyde's calling the American mind was raised, um, the sort of idea that um, parents are partly responsible for the attitudes and feelings of young people. I think there's creative stuff, obviously, you know, our parents shape us. So I do think, you know, there is something in there and the fact that our parents do put on us these very onerous ideas of harm does do us harm. And James? Yes, so someone asked us, is, is there the centre among this more student body? Yes, the problem is that many of us sort of sigh and joke about the latest fast world campaigners protest and organise petitions. Um, I mean, actually, I don't find these sort of progressive concepts like intersectionality, white fragility, and stuff like that really comes into what I hear in my classroom and what I hear in my lectures. It's weird in that when I'm in an, in an academic environment, there's plenty of debate going on, and we're discussing really quite sensitive issues like um, the pseudo-scientific racist ideas among uh, some early some medieval Islamic scholars, or the plenty of the rape and, and murder and stuff like that that goes on in, say, Gregory Tours history of the Franks. There's plenty of debate about really quite difficult issues, but it just in the academic environment, in classrooms, that it doesn't really translate into the wider student politics. Um, I think that's a really neat way of putting it. And uh, Jim. Two such quick points. I really agree with these points at the end about where is education. It seems that um, the authority of education and educators has diminished. But I think that's entirely the fault of education and educators who have actually kind of nurtured students in, 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 in terms of saying, them, we don't really know. You tell us what you want. Uh, and that's you know very kind of central in the sort of culture that's, that's been engendered in on university campuses. Uh, knowledge is one of very, very, very many values, and very often not at the top of those values either. And the second very, very quick point is, I do think the emphasis is on universities and lecturers and educators rather than so-called snowflake students, which is a bit of a caricature as we've, as we've, as we've heard. And uh, a couple of years ago, a guy from Student Union was at one of these sessions and he said, the thing about safe spaces is it's a bit like if he's having a pizza in his, his living room. He wants to be able to say who comes in and what they can say. And, and a lot of people kind of went along with that. And what that really betrayed is, is a broader problem beyond the, the activists, which is a kind of sense, you know, a, not a recognition of what a university actually is. It's not a private arrangement. Uh, it is a public intellectual institution in the public sphere. And we need to nurture students and tell students that that's what it is and make them excited about that. And finally, Tanya. So on that first question about is there pushback on campus, I think it's very limited. There are some societies run by students that try to, you know, invite the most right-wing, controversial speakers they can um, as a kind of uh, revolt against uh, student censorship. Um, but actually, most students just stay quiet. Um, and I think this indifference is a problem in itself, and it shows that a lot of students don't value the importance of free speech today. Um, but I think this links to um, the point there about whose fault is this, you know, why should students value free speech when they've grown up in a society where an older generation tell them that actually it's not an important value? When I was at school, um, often in assemblies, when we were told about British values, we were told that we shouldn't ever be offensive, you know, or cause someone events. Um, so yeah, by ridicul sorry, rid ridiculing students as a bunch of thin skin snowflakes, I think we do ignore the fact that it's often older generations who have encouraged a trend that we are seeing on campuses today. Thank you. We have a massive round of applause.